Hello everyone, welcome. Today we will be talking about auditory processing, specifically in the branch of biological psychology. So first off, to start off this discussion, what exactly is sound? We all hear sound, but what really is it? Well, sound is the result of a change in the pressure in the air. So a change in pressure in the air is what reaches our ear and it's what is sound. And the two main different characteristics of sound are amplitude and frequency. So if we were to draw like a wavelength or like a sinusoidal type curve, we would we would see what these two things really mean. So here's just a sinusoidal type curve. The amplitude is this height. So this is the amplitude. The frequency is how many of these little cycles pass per a second of time. So the frequency is how many of these little mo mo movements, these little cycles, you get per a second in time. And the amplitude is basically the height. Now, how does this connect to sound? Well, in terms of sound, amplitude is pressure. So it is how loud the sound is and how much pressure the sound actually has, as I said before. And this amplitude of sound, aka pressure, is measured in decibels, which I'm sure you've all heard of this unit of measurement in, in terms of sound and hearing. So that's amplitude. Next we have frequency. So frequency, as I explained earlier, is cycles that pass per second, and the frequency is the pitch of sound. So a low frequency means a low pitch, and a high frequency means a high pitch. So it's literally like speaking with a low pitch voice or a high pitch voice, singing with a low pitch voice or high pitch voice. It's frequency is pitch, amplitude is pressure. And so how sound actually reaches our brain? Well, that cannot occur without our favorite structure, the ear. So the ear is composed of three different segments, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. So let's let's dive in. Let's start with the outer ear. So the outer ear consists of the pinna, which is basically the outer covering of your ear. And what the pinna does is it funnels sound through the ear into the inner ear, which the inner ear is what does the most with this sound. So the pinna is what the outer ear, which contains the pinna, is what is funneling sound through the ear. Now, once the sound hits the eardrum, the eardrum is part of the middle ear over here. So the function of the outer ear, as I said, is to funnel sound into the ear. And the first place it hits is the eardrum. So the eardrum is the first part of the middle ear. And once that sound hits the eardrum, the eardrum starts to vibrate a little. And that vibration is what causes the next part of the eardrum Sorry, the next part of the middle ear, the ossicles, it's what causes the ossicles to vibrate as well. So the oss ossicles consist of the malus, incus, and stapes, in this order, sideways written. And the malus, incus, and stapes are all small bones in the middle ear, which come right after the eardrum, which vibrate as well as a result of the eardrum vibrating. Now keep in mind, as sound is funneled throughout the ear, the sound is going from a high surface area to a low frequency, sorry, to a low surface area because it's being funneled from the outside to the inside. So it's going from high frequent, sorry, high surface to low surface area. 
So back to where we were before, the malus incus and stapes are now vibrating as a result of the eardrum vibrating. And here, two bones play a very important role. These roles are the tympus tympani, sorry, tensor tympani, I don't know what I did there. Yeah, it's tensor tympani, not tympus. So those two bones are the temp tensor tympani and the stapedius. So the purpose of these two muscles or bones in the ear, in the middle ear, is to make sure that these three bones, the ossicles, don't vibrate too much because if they vibrate too dramatically, then damage can be caused to the ear. So the purpose of these two bones is to just, just um, put a cap on the amount of vibration the ossicles experience to protect the ear. Now, malus incus, incus and stapes are now vibrating and they have mechanical energy of the sound. And that sound, as I said earlier, needs to be funneled through the ear. So this mechanical energy of sound from the ossicles is sent to the oval window of the inner ear. So this is the oval window. It's located inside the cochlea, which we'll get into more detail about on the next slide. So this is the oval window. And the oval window is now experiencing the mechanical energy of sound which is given to it from the ossicles, the malus incus, and stapes. So as I said before, the oval window is part of the cochlea. So the cochlea is the part of the inner ear, so it is the main basic part of the inner ear. It is the main basic part of the inner ear, as I said before. And it is basically a wound up snail like structure. So the cochlea looks, ooh, sorry, apple pencil malfunction there. So, sorry about that. The cochlea looks like a wound up snail, basically just like that. That is the cochlea. And inside the cochlea is where the, the most important part of auditory processing is occurring. So the oval window is located on the in in the cochlea. So when the mechanical energy of sound from the ossicles is translated to the oval window, we have mechanical energy of sound in the cochlea as well. And the cochlea contains some very very important substances which are very important in the actual processing of auditory input. The main one is the organ of corti, and the organ of corti is the part of the cochlea which contains hair cells, and the hair cells are the most important, as I said before, in the understanding and processing of sound. The organ of corti consists of two different types of hair cells, inner hair cells <clears throat> and outer hair cells, and each of these hair cells actually has a different function. The function of inner hair cells is basically to connect the sound to the brain itself, more specifically the auditory cortex which is located in the temporal lobe of the brain. So inner hair cells, their function is to send auditory info to the brain, specifically auditory cortex of the temporal lobe. Outer hair cells have a different function as they're located on the outside. Their function is to amplify the sound that is being sent from the ossicles. And keep in mind, these hair cells lie atop a fluid membrane, which is called the basilar membrane. So there are your, these are very bad drawings, but they're, they're, here are your outer hair cells, and here are your inner hair cells, and they're lying atop the basilar membrane. And it's, it's a very common occurrence 
in the ear, as we've seen throughout this presentation, that when sound is entering the ear, a lot of vibration and oscillation occurs. And it's the same story with the basilar membrane. So the sound causes the basilar membrane to oscillate. And as we get into more depth in the next slides, you'll see how important this oscillation actually is. So let's jump right in. So we'll look, we'll take a closer look at the inner hair cells right now first, because the inner hair cells are what are actually sending the input to the brain itself. So like I said earlier, here is the basilar membrane and and um, the hair cell sits atop the basilar membrane. Above, you have the tectorial membrane. And, as I said, in between, you have the cell. So the cell, of course, consists of a nucleus, and it consists of vesicles, because once these, once um, some sort of depolarization and occurs and some channels open, these vesicles will open and release neurotransmitters. And over here, we have hairs, so actual like fibers, fibers of hair, actual hair that is sticking out of the cell. And the scientific name for these hair, hairs is stereocilia. So there are hairs sitting atop the hair cells, obviously, and they are called stereocilia. So let's see how the input of sound into the cochlea and specifically the organ of corti, which first things first leads to the oscillation of the basilar membrane. Let's see how that affects the hair cell itself. So the oscillation of the basilar membrane causes the stereocilia to actually sway. So the stereocilia will be bent over to the side. They'll move like this because they're swaying. So stereocilia are swaying. And once the stereocilia sway, they actually, this image isn't very accurate because they should be touching the tectorial membrane, but once the stereocilia sway, they actually, they actually touch the tectorial membrane, which causes these channels to open. These channel, ta channels are voltage-gated potassium channels, and as you can see, another thing that goes into the opening of these um, channels are these black things you see. These things are called tip links. Sorry for the disorganization, but these things are called tip links. And the tip links are what connect the stereocilia to each other. And once they sway, that movement causes the voltage-gated potassium channels, as you see right here in this red color, to open. <clears throat> So keep in mind, in a hair cell, the outside has a high concentration of K+, and the inside of the cell has a low concentration of K+. So which is why once you open the channel, all of this K+, which is concentrated in the outside, will come running into the inside, which is exactly what happens. So we have all this K+, that is entering through the stereocilia, and which is entering the cell. And you also have CA, CA2+, which is also entering the cell. Not as much as the potassium, though. But once you have this depolarization, which is occurring, then we see these two channels, which are the <clears throat> voltage-gated calcium channels, we see these channels open as well. And now we have an influx of calcium into the cell as well. So we have an, so let me just outline this. Vibration of basilar membrane causes the hairs, aka stereocilia, to sway. Swaying causes the stereocilia to touch with the tectorial membrane and causes the tip links to mechanically open these voltage-gated potassium channels, which and which causes an influx of potassium ions and calcium ions, and the influx of the calcium ions is what causes the voltage-gated calcium channels to open. So now you have a greater influx of Ca2 plus into the cell. And this influx of Ca2 plus will interact with these vesicles and cause those neurotransmitters 
inside to be released. So now we have the bursting of vesicles, which should sound very familiar to you from when we learned about action potential earlier in the semester. Specifically for inner hair cells, these neurotransmitters that are released, which I just talked about, this neurotransmitter will be, sorry, will be glutamate. So the glutamate will bind to the receptors on the afferent nerves. So there you have it. Those are the function of the inner hair cells and how it works. Now with the outer hair cells, there's nothing different. It's the same exact process as occurs in the inner hair cells, except instead of the release of glutamate, you will have the release of acetylcholine. And the only function of the, these cells, the outer hair cells, is to actually amplify the sound, not to send it to the brain. But in inner hair cells, it will, it will get sent to the brain. So, how exactly does this neurotransmitter travel to the auditory cortex, which is the primary part of the brain for auditory processing? How does it get there? Well, let's go over the auditory processing pathway. So the glutamate, which is released from the inner hair cells, will bind to ganglion cells. And there is an accumulation of ganglion cells in the brain stem of the brain. And the information, oops, sorry, information from these ganglion cells will go from the brain stem to the inferior colliculus inferior colliculus. So this inferior colliculus, colliculus is collecting the information that was released from the inner hair cells, aka the neurotransmitter glutamate. And it will pass that information to the medial geniculate cortex, which is the only thing standing between the inferior colliculus and the auditory cortex. So it is what is connecting the info from the inferior colliculus to the auditory cortex, which of course brings us to the auditory cortex. So the auditory cortex is located in the temporal lobe of the brain, and the auditory cortex is where your final auditory processing occurs, where you're able to process exactly what you're hearing and what that sound is. So there we go, we have successfully decoded how sound passes through the brain, actually through the ears, and then to the brain, and finally reaching